Your last homework before the exam is the one that I sent you by email. It will be due next Monday because I want you to have it back and be able to look at it before the exam. And I will actually be traveling next week Thursday through Sunday. Okay, otherwise I would probably have given you the homework on Wednesday. You could have had it until the next Wednesday, but then if you try to find me that Thursday and Friday, you may not be so lucky with that. That's why I decided to give it to you now. You know everything that you need to know for it, so that won't be a problem. Alright, so let's get back to handout number seven and hope that this projector bulb actually survives. Reciprocal space, that's what we talked about last week, right? That was a lot of new stuff. So we will review the last couple of slides which really contain the important parts. As I said, the whole scattering equation, I'm not going to ask you to do that derivation, but some of these things that come out of it are important. And the really important parts came about when we took what we had derived for the general scattering equation and we applied the periodicity of crystals because that is what we are really dealing with in crystallography, right? So that was when we realized that instead of summing over all space with all vectors from one starting point, we could actually describe a certain volume element which will happen to be the unit cell and apply the unit cell translations to that. And we know that they follow the three unit cell constants A, B and C and that we multiply them by integers. That allows us to describe where atoms are located in all space. And then we can plug this one in <coughs> and given that this is only defined when m1, m2, m3 are integers, we can draw these sums out. Then we applied the fact that every complex E function can be written as a sine and cosine function. which gives us an expression like this and what we will find is that we need to look at the cosine term for constructive interference and whenever n times lambda is equal to the lattice constant a times the scattering vector s we'll have constructive interference or reinforcement same holds true for the other two lattice constants and this is really what gives us the fraction data that we observe. The general scattering equation, that's just some kind of blob of intensity that is a little more intense or a little less intense in different places. Okay? Wouldn't be very useful with respect to what we look at most of the time. There are times when you need to look at diffuse things like that. As a matter of fact, Indira is working with small angle diffraction, right? A lot of that goes for these more diffuse scattering data and you need to analyze them. If you do what we call normal wide angle diffraction, you have a much easier life because what you will get is solutions for your scattering vector that follow a set of planes in each dimension, which means if you have a three-dimensional crystal with a three-dimensional repeat, you get the intersection of three sets of planes, which means points. So you get your reciprocal lattice points. And that's the stuff that we had derived graphically before we went into this map. Okay? So, these are important conditions. They need to be fulfilled for you to see diffraction from your crystals. There's one additional condition that has to be uh, fulfilled which we hadn't looked at yet. If you look at these expressions, you see that there's a vector S over lambda, right? There's a fourth condition which often is referred to as the Ewald sphere construction. And what we have to remember is we defined our scattering vector, it was S minus S0, right? That was that long derivation. And it, we can now choose a reference frame where we simply divide all of these vectors by lambda, because that is what we get in those other three conditions anyway. And then we can draw some incoming x-rays. They hit a set of crystal planes, lattice planes, whatever we want to call them. And we have a straight vector that goes through them, transmitted intensity, which we'll call S0 over lambda. So it's no longer a vector 
that is 1 it is a vector that has a length of 1 over lambda. We have a scattered vector in the direction of S. And then we have what we call the scattering vector, capital S, divided by lambda. And what we can do is we can choose a reference frame where we put the origin of reciprocal space right here at the point of transmitted intensity. And then we start numbering everything from here. This is just choosing a reference frame. Okay. The main thing is that we then, when we start numbering, get a lot of reciprocal lattice points. Now, only when a reciprocal lattice point touches the Ewald sphere will you actually record diffraction intensity. Okay. And this is something that kind of explains why you don't end up with a big mess when you shoot x rays at a crystal, right? Because if every single diffraction condition was recorded at the same time, you wouldn't really end up with a beautiful, easy to interpret pattern. What you would end up with is a big mess of intensity all over the place. So, luckily for us, we have this so-called sphere of reflection and only when a lattice point touches the e sphere will we actually record it. Now, what does it mean? What it means is that we could rotate our reciprocal lattice so that different points touch the e sphere. Of course that would mean we are rotating our entire diffractometer and that's not very feasible, is it? But, alternatively we can just rotate that crystal from which everything originates, right? Because that means that we basically reorient the reciprocal lattice that comes from the crystal, doesn't it? Now, is it easy to rotate a crystal? A lot easier than rotating a diffractometer, right? We need to mount it in a way that we can actually rotate it. I agree. But if we mount it on something that has rotational degrees of freedom, rotating a crystal is really pretty trivial. Okay? And that is what all modern diffractometers do. They rotate the crystal. And that means that we rotate reflections and whenever they touch this e sphere, this sphere with a radius of 1 over lambda, then we will actually see a reflection in our diffraction pattern. So this is the fourth condition, also known as the wavelength condition. We need to fulfill all of them in order to see diffraction in our collected data. Now, what does that mean? What do we see? Well, let's have a look at Bragg's law. We already visited that in crystal space, right? Now we'll look at reciprocal space. Because that is where we work most of the time. First of all, what we do is we define a distance d star in reciprocal space, which is simply the distance from the origin of reciprocal space to each of the lattice points, reciprocal lattice points. Okay? nothing magic about that, we just call it d star. And of course according to what we just said about how we think about reciprocal space and where we put our origin, that means d star is equal to s over lambda. Right? Because that is how we designated the distance from the origin of reciprocal space to the lattice point. Now, if we look at this construction over here, and we'll use the board under it again, there are a couple of things to keep in mind. First of all, the length of S0 and the length of S were what? Both were 1, right? And the most important part is not even that they are 1, but the fact that they are equal right now. Actually, we will use later on that they are 1, so good thing that we already dug that out. So, this and that are equal length. So if I draw a line right in the middle of that angle, and that scattering angle is a change in diffraction by 2 theta, right? Then each of these angles is what? Theta. 
What's this distance? From here to there. It's one half of D star, right? Because the full distance from here to there is D star or S over lambda. So one half of that has to be one half. So we can write a nice little sentence where we say sine of theta is equal to what? D star over 2 divided by S0 divided by lambda, length of S0 and length of D star. And yes, now we can make use of the fact that that one is 1. So if we rearrange things, because we don't like double fractions, right, who does? And make use of the fact that this one is 1, then we get sine theta is equal to d star times lambda divided by 2. Okay. If we now rearrange this expression, multiply by 2, divide by d star, we get exactly this one. Okay. Very trivial derivation in reciprocal space. So, 2 sine theta over d star is equal to lambda. What's the big deal? Well, that is what directly follows out of that because we know that 2d sine theta is equal to lambda, right? So, we can directly get the relationship of d and d star through this reciprocal lattice. And this is exactly what you were told, right? about your marking distances on the normal. So this does not disagree with the graphical derivation of the reciprocal lattice. But this one puts it into a mathematical reference frame where you can see where it comes from. Okay. This is certainly an important equation. You do want to remember that one. You will need it. Why do you need it? Because a lot of times we need to actually figure out what these spacings are, but we don't measure them directly, do we? Nor do we measure A, B and C directly. Usually we measure data in reciprocal space. So we get some ideas of these D star values and of these A star, B star and C star values. And what our job is when we look at a crystal is to go back from this information to figuring out what are the real space crystal lattice constants, A, B, C, alpha, beta, gamma. Okay. That may sound almost trivial. Often it's not that trivial. If you have something that has orthogonal axes, it's not that bad, okay? But crystals are not required to have 90 degree angles between their unit cell axes then things become a little less trivial. Now, in order to calculate these spacings, you can't just directly go from A, B, C, alpha, beta, gamma. Okay? The way you calculate your D spacings is from D star. Because in the reciprocal lattice, you have a direct relationship <coughs> between D star and your reciprocal Here it is. It's pretty simple, isn't it? D star is equal to H A star plus K B star plus L C star. Remember that equation. Also remember, these four are vectors. They have a length, they have a direction. Okay, it's very important. 
You can calculate D by calculating the length of D star. Okay? Now, how do you calculate the length of a vector? I've been treating it like that's, you know, very trivial and once you realize how to do it, it's not that bad, but how do we actually calculate the length of a vector? We multiply the vector by itself, that gives us a scalar, if we do a dot product, right? And then we take the square root, that gives us the length of a vector. And then we can divide 1 by that length and we get our d. Once again, that's an order, uh, that's a magnitude d, that is not a vector, okay? How easy or how difficult will it be? Here's a very useful table. This is a so-called d-spacing formula. No, do not memorize this one. It's a very nice resource. It tells you for each of the seven crystal systems what d star squared, so for d star you would just get the square root of this is, and how that relates to d with respect to the real space constants. Now, how did they come up with these expressions? It's a good question, right? So let's do the derivation for a fairly simple system, okay? So, let's take the tetragonal crystal system. Let's not take the easiest one which would be cubic. Let's take the tetragonal one. Where do you think we should start? Best thing to start is general equation, right? What general equation could we use? take the one that we just learned about. Okay. Now, when you do stuff like that, make sure you write vectors. And the easiest way to write vectors is to put the little arrow above them. If you insist on doing the bold print like I do on my transparencies, fine, be my guest, but make sure I can recognize it's bold. Okay? The arrow is probably the easiest way to indicate it. And that's for your own benefit, because math with vectors is a little bit different than math without vectors, okay? Now, what do we really want? What you would probably be told is that I want to know what d is, okay? As a function of the real space lattice constants a, b, c, alpha, beta, gamma. That would probably be your homework or exam or whatever problem. So, what do we have to do to get there? We don't have any of those things written in that equation, do we? How does D relate to anything here? d is equal to 1 over d star, right? The d star is not a vector but a length. So that means I can figure out that whole d thing if I can figure out the length of d star, right? 
which goes back to we figure out the length of a vector by squaring it and taking the square root, right? So Just multiply that vector by itself. Now, how do we multiply this? Pairwise, right? So we start out with h squared a star times a star, which is what? The length of a star squared, right? Plus k squared, b star squared, l squared, c star squared, and Indira says that's it. Does everybody agree? Well, we multiply the vector by a vector, right? What do we get, a scalar? Right? And if you multiply a vector with itself, you can just square the length. And yes, you could have written that as a star times a star or magnitude of a star times magnitude of a star. All of those would be considered correct. Now, if I had not written vectors here, would this be correct? If I had not written vectors here, it would be correct? It wouldn't, right? Because wouldn't I have to multiply this by that? And this by that? And that one by this? And that one by that? And so on? That's multiplication rules for numbers, right? If I have a sum of numbers, everything in the first sum is multiplied with everything in the second sum. So, I can't just write this without writing something else. What do I have to write? Why can I neglect all those terms? Because the angles are 90 degree. Or you could just say all other terms are zero because all angles are 90 degree. But that is a statement that I do want to see, okay? And that's why I said it's important that you write the vectors, so you realize that you have vectors. A few years back we had a student who very much refused to write vectors. I know these are vectors, 
I said, well, first of all, I don't know it when I look at your piece of paper. And secondly, you might forget one day. I won't forget. I said, well, I still may not know. So they refused to write vectors. Always remember they were vectors on homeworks and similar things. Guess where the student forgot it? On the exam. Student ended up with a very nasty equation with a heck of a lot of terms. Student had no idea where to go with that nasty equation because, yeah, you were never supposed to deal with that nasty equation. But a lot of these things become zero. So it will come back to bite you, okay? And it may come back to bite you at the most inopportune time. Write your vectors. Besides which, even if you do all your math right, if you don't indicate your vectors, I'm not going to like it. Okay? So, once we are here, what can we do? What do we know about a tetragonal system? A equal to B not equal to C in real space. And what do we know about the reciprocal lattice? It has to have the same symmetry, right? So what should hold true here? The length of A star is going to be equal to the length of B star, right? Well, that looks a lot simpler, but what did I tell you how I wanted D as a function of? First of all, I want D, not D star, right? And secondly, I want it as a function of ABC. Do we know anything about how these reciprocal lattice constants are related to the real space lattice constants? Any idea? Something like 1 over A. Is equal to what? What do you think holds true for C? So we can use that in this equation a step further. We have d star as a function of ABC. But what will we ask for? D. How do we get there? This is a step where you have to watch. It's very easy to go here and to say, oh, d squared is 1 over d star squared, so it's equal to a squared over h squared plus k squared plus c squared over l squared, right? Very easy mistake to make, very tempting. But you can't d 
divide by a sum by just flipping each part of the sum. Okay? You actually have to go the, that more complicated route. Now, do we really like what we see? Still looks pretty darn complicated, doesn't it? So, is there anything we can do to make this easier? We can take what of those? LCM of the denominator. We can solve the square root how? Simply by taking the LCM between the square and C square. So what you're saying is you need to get them on the same numerator? Uh, on the same let's see, denominator. Yes? So what we will have is that one, right? That's what you meant. Basically multiplied both sides of the fraction with a squared c squared. Means the a squared drops out and it still looks a bit on the complicated side, right? But at least we can draw some part of a square root here. That's what Anil decided to do, right? And that still looks like a pretty darn horrible equation. Doesn't it? Could you work with it? Sure. But most of the time, people work with something that is simpler, okay? Where did life get really complicated? What step here? At this step, right? And we can discuss whether it was the 1 over or the square root, okay? This is the step where things got very complicated. So, we could actually first leave the square root out, okay, and leave everything squared. What you will also see in that table is that things are reported frequently as something to the power of minus 1, okay. So if you look back here and you look at the tetragonal system, here's the equation that we arrived at, right? h squared plus k squared times a star squared plus l squared times c star squared. They did put in the 1 over a equal to a star, the 1 over c equal to c star. And they arrived at this expression that we had too, right? And then they actually say that d star uh, that d squared is equal to this expression to the power of minus 1. Okay? Of course, if you were asked to give me d, you would say it's this expression to the power of minus 1 half. Okay? Because that's d. But, it would be perfectly legitimate to write down that expression, which is really what we had over here, right? That's that expression. This to the power of minus one half. You can play more tricks with it, but in many cases they really won't make your life that much more simple. Okay?
There's just so much you can do with these expressions. But this is what your computer uses to check crystal systems, okay? What your computer does is, it measures this data. It can figure out what A star, B star, C star look like. It's not a problem. Because it can figure out how do these lattice points repeat in reciprocal space. So it can figure out A star, B star, C star, it can figure out D star. Then comes the big testing. Because it doesn't know the HKLs. Right? And it has to go back and see which of these formulae is actually fulfilled. Luckily for you, the computer does the job, okay? In many cases, it's a push of the button if you do deal with single crystal data. In the old days, people had to do this by hand. Guess what? High symmetry crystal systems were really, really popular. I guess we can understand why. Because if you look at what comes out for these lower symmetry ones, pretty ugly. Okay. Now this is a very useful table if you ever do need to go back and manually look at certain lattice constants. For example in systems that are symmetry related, but it seems that one of the numbers changed. This allows you to go back and actually manually figure out what some of these lattice constants are. Okay. The Lead and Palmer is one of the few books where I found this full table for all seven crystal systems. Most books show you for the cubic or tetragonal system how it is done, and that's it. The really nasty ones that you would rather just look up are the ones that they don't show you. So here's the table, it's in your notes, if you ever need it in the future. So, what do we actually see? based on everything that we've said so far, based on our properties of the reciprocal lattice that we've learned. Well, if you have a single crystal, there's exactly one orientation in real space, right? Sure, if you rotate the crystal, it's a different one, but still, at any point in time, it's one orientation. That means there's one orientation of the corresponding reciprocal lattice, right? That means that we get reciprocal lattice points, they are resolved, and we will get a diffraction pattern that consists of spots, okay, whenever one of them touches the evolved sphere. Now, how about we have a powder sample? How many particles do we have in a powder sample? Thousands, millions, a lot, any or all of the above plenty. As a matter of fact, a powder should be an infinite number of randomly oriented particles, okay? We'll get back to that once we start dealing a little more with powder data. So, a lot of them. That means how many orientations of the reciprocal lattice? As many as we have crystallized, right? Because each of them is probably in a different orientation. We get all these overlapping reciprocal lattices and that means we don't get well-resolved spots. That means we get kind of spheres, right? Because all that now matters is that distance d star. It's no longer a vector in only one direction. That vector can go in all kinds of different directions because we have all kinds of different orientations of the reciprocal lattice. That means the only thing that is preserved is the length of that vector. Okay? pointing in all different directions with the same length. That is what describes the sphere, right? So, we have the Ewald sphere, the wavelength condition, and we have a sphere of reciprocal lattice points. What's the intersection between the two? How do two spheres intersect? three-dimensional imagination again. 
one sphere, another sphere. How do they intersect? Circle. Right? Can everybody see that? So, what you will see in a powder experiment are so-called powder rings. Okay? There's an example of that. Here's that sphere, that circle that intersects. Now, if you've ever worked with single crystals before, okay, you may have had something and there were some rings showing up on your refraction pattern and your crystallographer said, gee, you brought me a powder. And if you knew nothing about reciprocal space, you were probably scratching your head thinking, what are they talking about? That's what they're talking about, okay? If you see rings, they result from a powder. Now, if there are also sharp spots, maybe your sample is a single crystal and the powder is ice that was built on the crystal. That happens. If there are no sharp spots, and chances are what you offered as a single crystal wasn't a single crystal, okay? So, if you put a powder on a single crystal refractometer, you will get powder rings. That is how you recognize that you have a powder on your machine. Most powder diffractionists don't put their powders on a single crystal diffractometer. They would rather put it on a powder diffractometer and because we know that this is happening, all that we do is we scan along one dimension, okay? Because we say it doesn't matter whether I measure that ring here or there or there or there or there. It really doesn't matter. All I have to do is go through that ring. So that's why we can do one dimensional measurements in powder diffraction. Because if you think about it, it doesn't matter where we measure as long as we measure all the distances from the origin of reciprocal space. That's the only requirement. So, you can even explain what your data looks like by understanding reciprocal space. As I said, this is a very important concept. Okay. Now, I believe that's the last slide in this handout. And we could of course move to the next handout, but one of the things I would like to do is actually go back and do something else. And the reason for that is, how many of you have come to discuss with me on those two folds and mirrors? Can I see a show of hands? Who had questions about those? So the majority of the class, right? So, I figured we may want to practice a few more with different numbers, all kinds of different stuff, so that we can kind of get a better feel for it and make sure that everybody really knows how to do them, okay? And yes, you can get another coffee, tea or cookie. You are allowed to take more than one cookie. I grant you permission. I was trying to break some papers and right after you called me on Friday, I passed out. Yes. Cut.
image. So, there are a whole bunch of them and we don't have all of them in the field of view right now, so let's see what we can do about that. Ah, now we got them. Good. Guess what? Who's going to do the work on this one? Good! Good! <laughs> so, let's see. Shall we today for a change go in alphabetical order? So that means Nick and Steven can find out who's going to start. Any volunteers? <laughs> you can pick what you want to do, that's your advantage for going first. <laughs> and Anthony's thinking, oh, I'm pretty early in the alphabet too. <laughs> All right, Nick picked a twofold. Does everybody agree with this result? Yes. I think it's plus. It was a plus originally, so now it's a minus. <coughs> yes, this was a plus. Sorry, this this overhead is not really the best of all, but yes, it is indeed a plus. So yes, this is a plus, that's a plus, minus, minus, plus, plus, that's a minus. So maybe whoever does one should read what is written to the original object to the class. Let's see, Nathan, you would be next. Minus. Yeah, you could just reinforce the minus. That's a good idea. Anthony, guess who's next? <laughs> <laughs> that is permitted. Do we need more coffee? We can make some more coffee. No takers? Okay, don't complain afterwards. I chose the easy one, uh, B, just one fourth minus, it's mere selection. People are complaining to you. I know. Yeah. <laughs> Teamwork seems to work pretty well here, doesn't it? There we go. I always forget to hit them. Pretty important. Yeah. All right. Anil, guess what's next? All right. Anil took I. 
which is a twofold that says next to it a quarter plus. You put next to it another one that says minus one quarter minus. Everybody agree with that? It was one quarter plus originally, mm -hmm. and now it's minus one quarter minus. Why are there two minuses? Good question, right? As I said, a lot of people came to ask me because they were confused about this. The question is, what do all these things mean? That is where people usually get confused. Okay? And if we look at things flipped by 90 degree, if this is my zero plane, okay? If I draw this, this would be an object that is sitting at zero. Not at plus, not at minus, at zero. The plus and minus is a crystallographer's lazy way of dealing with things, okay? It's the equivalent of a mathematician's variable x. But we just write a plus or a minus. So what does plus mean? Any displacement from the zero position. And that is where life gets confusing. It could be anything, okay? Now, given that the variable isn't defined, at least in my head for imagining things and applying these little symmetry operations, I can make it whatever is most convenient for me, right? That's the liberty I have. It should work for anything on that variable. So here's what I like doing. <coughs> this to me is plus sitting on top of the plane. It's this place, true enough, okay? But it's still touching my plane. Guess what? This is my minus. Still touching the plane, but it's hanging off the plane. And that, to me, makes it easier to envision what is going on with it. Now, in that case, what does a quarter plus mean? First of all, it's not the zero plane, right? It's the plane at one quarter. And where does the object sit? On top, right? Because it's a plus. So this one is one quarter plus. Okay? So, where's my twofold? My twofold is in the plane of the paper because there's no number next to it, right? Where does it rotate this? First of all, it rotates the plus one quarter plane to minus one quarter, right? And what happens to the object? It goes to below. So that's why we call this one minus one quarter minus, okay? One is the plane, one is the orientation of the object. You can also do it with a little cup, okay? Cup pointing up is plus, cup pointing down is minus. Yes? So why is it, it wasn't at the origin, wasn't that upside down too? Well, this would be plus, right? You can look at it however you want to, okay? It could just be a displacement of a perfectly spherical object. Yeah. It could be an object that isn't quite spherical, in which case I could regard the plus as what way is it pointing? Okay? It really doesn't matter. Whatever helps you envision it. I don't care how you work with it. Some people may like to actually use X, okay? Hey, be my guest. Because that's something, if this one said one, four, one quarter plus X, then you would probably have much less of a problem with the minus one quarter minus X, Chris, right? Be my guest. Use the X, okay? Whatever helps you deal with it as long as you know how to get the final notation that a crystallographer gets out of that operation. That's the only thing that is a requirement, okay? All right, let's see. Wow, we are doing a big jump in alphabet here, aren't we? I think you're next.
make that plus really visible. Yeah. All right. Adam pick B. That's the next one that usually confuses people, right? I actually agree with what is written, okay? Now, how does this work? We have an object that starts at plus, okay? So, if we use that cup, or a circular object, I don't care what. This is a plane. Here's my object at plus out of the plane of the paper, right? Here's my twofold. One third of the way up. What happens to this object? Everything here is rotated. The zero plane goes to two-thirds, right? Because it needs to have the same distance from the two-fold as it had originally. This object, where does it go? It'll be pointing at my two-fold, right? Which is what? It's minus, right? Because it was pointing that way, now it's pointing the other way. That is where I like the whole idea of something that has a direction to it, okay? It can make my plus and minus very obvious. So, it's indeed two-thirds minus. In the All right, Indira rotated from minus one quarter and she says we are going to one quarter plus. Do people agree or not? Want to speak up here? Well, whether you write one fourth plus or plus one fourth plus, that's the same, okay? Because if you don't specify, it's a positive number. But is there a difference between plus one fourth and plus one fourth plus? Yes. Where did we start? Minus one quarter. What does that mean? It's on the minus one quarter plane. Want to modify? No, 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 that was fine, don't do that. It is on the minus one quarter plane, where does it rotate? Below. Well, was it above or below to start with? No, 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 no. Where was the object originally? That's the question we need to answer. It's below zero, but compared to the minus one quarter plane, where's your object? On the plane. On the plane. So, I was happy with your plus one quarter plane, but where is the object? You have this object. Right? Where does it go on the next plane after rotation? If it is positive, it goes below the plane. Well, compared to this very plane, is it positive or negative? The general position changes. But 
Let's take this object, okay? What do we call this object? On the plane. On the plane. If we rotate that, where does it go? On the plane. On the plane. Does it get a plus or a minus? No. Okay. Your object starts on a plane. Where does it go? On the plane. On the plane. And yes, it's a plus one quarter plane, but what does this indicate? Negative. That indicates above the plane, right? And it's not above the plane. Can you make it a negative? What would negative indicate? Below, Below the plane, but you say it's on the plane, so what do we write? Minus no, it was at minus one fourth here, right? Oh, it's just one. It's just one four. Exactly. You picked a tough one. It's a trick one. Yes, it's only one fourth because it's on the plane. So you gotta pay attention where the plus and minus stands, right? This is mean, isn't it? This word is that Problem is, there is no second plus or minus here, okay? So it's not it's touching the plane, you don't need to tell what It is centered on it. It is like that sphere that is drawn halfway above, halfway below. So the center of gravity is on the plane. Yes? So there's no orientation about the plane. In that case, it would be no orientation, right? But there is. Actually. It depends on your object. Well, if it is a cup, it's not one atom, okay? That's your starting point. Something that doesn't have an extension of plus or minus has to be perfectly symmetrical, right? Otherwise, it wouldn't all be sitting right on the plane. I mean, you can only have one atom sitting at zero. The second atom would have to sit somewhere else, okay? So if you have a molecule, your molecule is not going to be entirely sitting at zero. And unless your molecule is perfectly symmetrical, your molecule will have some kind of center of gravity up or down. It's just not possible otherwise. So like I is not on the plane, but that's the I is not on the plane because it has a plus after the number. The plus after the number indicates an unspecified change, okay? And if you do use that variable x in your head, let's check. One fourth plus x, does that make sense as a mathematical expression? Minus x one fourth, does that make sense as a mathematical expression? Not really, right? Nobody in their right mind would write that. So this is a minus that you can't just put an x behind it and it makes sense. If it was minus one fourth minus, to say minus one fourth minus x, that would make sense, okay? So it's only the dangling plus or minus that doesn't have a number with it where it makes sense to use it as that unspecified offset. If there's a number behind it, that plus or minus refers to that number. And that is where Indira got tricked, okay? There was a minus here. But the minus actually only refers to the number next to it. Okay? Let's see. Shoo. so fine. Arr. Guess you'll have to write with this one. It'll be rather big and ugly. Oh, 
All right, so it started with one quarter plus, okay? For those who can't quite read that. It was rotated around one quarter. And so Shu said it ends up at one quarter minus. And that's the next one that usually boggles people's minds. But I must say, I actually like where it ended up. So, how did that one work? Yeah. Well, it really is. It's the same as this one, okay? The only difference is everything is one quarter displaced. Your object is at one quarter plus, your tuple is at one quarter, so your object just goes to one quarter minus. This is another one of those. Some people prefer to keep working at one quarter. Some people prefer translating everything down to zero. Doing the operation and translating back. Whatever works for you. Okay. Some people don't mind having their object dislocated, but they do mind having their operation dislocated. Translate it. Okay? It's mathematically all possible. It just requires that you know what you want to do and how to work it. Chris? All right, move it up a little bit so people can actually see. There was a mirror where the object was at minus one quarter. And so Chris put the object at minus one quarter with different handedness. So. Yes. So basically we had an object at minus one quarter, we have a yeah. mirror plane, no orientation, and so yes it does, but he indicated that. There is no dislocation from the center of gravity. Okay, there's no orient, no vector that dislocates the center of gravity from the plane. That is really what it means. This is a chiral object, okay, obviously, or we couldn't change handedness. Or if it is an achiral object, then the two things are the same, okay. If this was just one atom, okay. If, if, if this was one atom, it wouldn't be chiral. I agree. Okay. Now, if you take a mirror plane and you put one atom here and you put one atom there, you get the same atom back. Doesn't matter what handedness I designate in that case, okay. It just happens to end up being the same. But if this was an object that is chiral, what the minus one quarter really means is that the center of gravity of that object is at minus one quarter. It's not displaced. Okay? If this is one atom, I agree with you. It's not chiral. But if it is a molecule, it could be chiral. Not necessarily. I have a chiral object. Carbon with four different atoms around it. Okay? That means it's chiral. If that carbon is sitting right on that plane, I would probably describe that object as sitting right on the plane. Okay? 
it's still a chiral object it's just that the center point of that object is sitting on the plane so I wouldn't describe that center point as being dislocated I would describe that center point as being at exactly minus one quarter but the fact that it extends in three-dimensional space means it still is chiral when I apply a mirror to that that carbon atom is still going to be sitting on a plane all the atoms around it are going to be arranged differently which is why I changed the handedness if we do talk about chiral it has to be something that is chiral right So yes, in the end, everything would be on the level of a molecule. For simplicity of imagining things, you can sometimes go a route where you don't have to have something huge and bulky in your head, okay? But in the end, it could be a molecule, absolutely. And that is why you need to keep all that chirality. So even if you just draw one circle, you need to keep the chirality because that one circle doesn't have to be one atom. The cup isn't chiral, okay, so let's face it. The cup is just something you can use to envision where things are going. No, it's not a chiral object. Well, this cup happens to be chiral because somebody squished it. So this one actually might work, okay. So sometimes it's easier to envision things without using something chiral but in the end you need to double check is this something where chirality changes because it could be a chiral object in real life. Does that make more sense? Stephen, plenty of time to think. That one doesn't work any. Oh, it works again. Good. Ooh, how did we get that? Two thirds gets it where? How does it make it make three halves? So, you're saying that an object at zero rotated around two-thirds goes to minus two-thirds. Yes? All right. Does anybody agree or disagree? What would you like? So, some people would like four-thirds. All right. What do we have in crystals? Does it matter whether I write 0 or I write 1? No, right? I'm just one unit cell over. So instead of 4 thirds, what else could I write? 1 third. Now if I take a different perspective, what else would this be? minus two-thirds, right? Because one minus two-thirds is one-third. So, not sure why Stephen chose to use a set of numbers that confuses some people, but it's a correct number, okay? It just depends on your perspective. First thing that would probably have come to my mind is the four-thirds, which you should probably translate down to one-third to keep things in the same unit cell. But yeah, that's the same as minus two-thirds. Sure enough is. Confusing, huh? Well, guess what, those of you who thought that life was easy. Second round.
Actually, I disagree on that statement. That one might not write, Nick. Once again, do people agree or disagree? It said one half plus to start with. It says one half minus now. Now this is the one place, okay, where one of the plus minuses doesn't matter. Whether you write plus one half or minus one half, arbitrary, okay? Because let's check. If I go from 0 plus 1 half, I'm at half a unit cell. If I go from 0 to minus 1 half, I'm still in the middle of a unit cell, okay? So, some of you might have been tempted to call it minus 1 half minus. It's exactly the same thing as 1 half minus, because all you are is one unit cell over. Nathan. <laughs> that one may not write. Yep. Well, you should usually be drawing the object to indicate that the handedness doesn't change, but that's fine. So, it was at a quarter plus, the twofold is at one half, and Nathan decided that the object is going to three quarters minus. That's one of the tougher ones, okay? But that's indeed what that object will be doing. Starting to get the feel for the three-dimensional arrangement of things here? I guess it just, when it started, I didn't realize which, like for A, which plus is match. How would I have to send it with the second match? It's really pretty. Yeah. So it's all an issue of three-dimensional viewing, okay? The object originally is almost a quarter away from the two-fold. So in the end, it should be almost <coughs> a quarter away from the two-fold. As I said, some people don't like the double numbers. Could you have translated all of that down by one half? Yeah. If we translate everything by minus one half, then this one becomes minus one quarter plus, right? This one is at zero. Oh, let's check. Do we have minus one quarter somewhere? Well, we have plus one quarter, okay, but the same kind of game. We would rotate it. Minus one quarter plus would go to plus one quarter minus. Then we translate back one half and we add three quarter minus, okay? If people don't like having multiple numbers, you can do that, okay? There's no problem with that. Or you can work right where it is. Personal preference. Anthony. H? L is the one we just did, right? It was one quarter plus. Yeah, so plus one quarter plus. Which one did you just do? P. And one third plus rotated around the one half axis. Goes to two thirds minus. Once again, it has to be the same distance from the twofold as the original object. Starting to get a hang of it? Is it starting to be a lot easier than it was when you first saw it? Ania. Yeah. 
And Neil took the mirror. These mirrors are getting boring, aren't they? All you do is change the handedness. Yes, you're next. The big jump in alphabet. So you had an object at minus, we have a twofold at one half, and the object goes to plus. Could of course make it one plus, but that's the same as plus. All right, in there. One of the last two. Are you sure? What is where? The, the object is where? At zero. The twofold is where? At one half. Where does the new object go? No, where does the new object go? On the plane. On what plane? plane. It goes here? The twofold here makes it go onto it? Yes. Really? Above. It was away from the plane and now it goes onto it? One. One? Yes. You got it. Can you just you wouldn't have to specify anything. Yes, it would be perfectly legitimate to just do this because that's one and one is zero, right? Because the unit cell translation. So yeah. <coughs> that's a boring one, isn't it? It really doesn't make a new object. All right. I guess Stephen and Chris are unlucky and Shu gets the last one. <laughs> well, we could tell Stephen to make one up for Chris and Chris one for Stephen, right? So it's kind of revenge. <laughs> All right. So Shu took N, which is at plus, rotated around three quarters, which gets it to six quarters, right? which is three halves and he translated it down one unit cell so it's one half because it was a plus originally it's a minus now very good do these make more sense now? good in that case we reached our goal because it seemed that those were kind of mind-boggling for most people and yes they are because it's a lot of notations you know thrown into very little stuff but once you realize what they are, they are really useful, okay? And part of it is, you have to deal with them on those space group drawings, okay? And plane group drawings. It's what crystallographers use. So if you can't interpret them, life is tough. Now, some of these, I'll admit, it's an exercise, okay? It's an exercise for you. Let's face it. One quarter plus is your starting object. If plus really is a simple variable, anybody in their right mind write that? We could just write plus, right? Because that would absorb that other thing. So, why does anybody bother? Well, fact is, we do have rotation axes that are not in the plane of the paper, okay? We do have rotation axes at a quarter at a half, at three quarters. They exist. And they are not at some plus or minus. They are at an exact number. Now, if I start with some ob object that has a plus designation, I need to give everything else relative to it. Okay? 
So, if I rotate around something that is at one quarter, relative to my original object, my final object will have a number and a plus or minus next to it. Okay? It's unavoidable if some of my symmetry operations are not in the plane of the paper. And in most space groups, there will be symmetry operations that are not in the plane of the paper. So that's why I am making you do these exercises. Because if you would generate the full set of objects, there would be some that have that number next to them. Because you can't just change the variable in the middle of it. Okay? Your first object can always be at plus. It's not a problem. But your other objects may be in different locations. Does that make sense? So that's why you are being teased and made to work with these numbers. Part of it is, it's just an exercise. It's a brain exercise. You can handle these. You can handle any of them. Okay? So, that would be it for today. A little bit of review and of course the rest of reciprocal space. We will start with the structure factors on Wednesday. And we will keep going from there. Um, I believe on Monday we still do a lecture next week and after that we play Jeopardy to review things for exam one. At that point in time you should be prepared, have started to look at all these things, know the symbols, know these things because no in Jeopardy you're not allowed your notes. <coughs> you are allowed your group mates because we will be having groups, okay? Any questions at this point in time? You're not allowed notes on the test either. No. You're not allowed groups on the test either. No. I'm sorry. I'm so picky. I know. I have a quick question about the 